performance. Coltrane plays everything from a wicked pope to Mary Magdalene, all in the day's work for someone you may have seen last week, playing Charles Bronson, playing Ken Livingstone in the comic strip's latest film. We talked to Coltrane at his farm near Glasgow about his diverse career. The weather's always like this. It's, uh, it's unpredictable, it's healthy, it's... Uh, I don't mind, actually. I like it. I was in California last year for about three months and every day you got up it was the same kind of weather and the palm trees were swaying and everyone was in shorts and I thought... He loves living in Scotland. No reason why he can't live in Scotland and, and make movies in Hollywood or whatever. <laughs> to say on your own behalf before I pass sentence? Guilty! Eh? I mean, what all like, post schools do really is, you know, they teach you manners and things like that, and I'm all for that. But they, they, really what they do is they teach you to assume your role in the class system, which is naturally at the top. And uh, alienates you deeply from almost every other sector of the community. And the last time I was in court, I was up in front of a beak who had a Glenarm and tie on. The guy who's defending me had a Glenarm and tie on. The guy who's prosecuting you had a Glenarm and tie on. And I thought, oh. And you, Mr. Fitty, 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 Mr. Glenarm and nothing, nothing. Mr. Smash and Grab, meet up, dead quiet, what? Make my own business. I'm a lamb, do you know, me, bo? Thank you, Fitty, Fitty, Fitty. Go and you start with me, and you, what you laughing at? I met a lot of people who were totally inarticulate, which is the first time, you know, you've got... One of the tricks they teach you at public school is how to express yourself and say what you want. And uh, I met a lot of people there who, particularly at art school, where people are sort of visually oriented, who just didn't, couldn't actually say what they wanted. And that sort of confirmed my political suspicions. Because it, it's just a trick, you know? It's not because you don't have any wants or that their wants are unworthy, it's just that they're not... Um, practiced in expressing them. Take my advice. Keep your head down and your pecker up. Always carry a sharp pencil and a big rubber. They'll try to tell you you can't draw. Don't listen to them. Yeah. Don't dog the life class. I did. Look what happened to me. Glasgow being a peculiar place itself uh, and the surrounding area, then Glasgow School of Art has a, a call on all these uh, strange and wonderful people. Because it's the people who make the art school, obviously. When I was there, people would say, uh, you're at college, where are you at? I'd say, I'm at Glasgow Art School. They'd go, oh, really? <laughs> you know? Because <laughs> they were all at Chelsea and um, the Slade, and they were the places in the 60s to go. Very interesting. But now it's whew, Glasgow Art School. Wow. <laughs> you know? Is that, that's another of the great myths, isn't it? That there's some place at any one time where everything happens. It's kind of adolescent notion, really, isn't yeah, it? It's a bit weird. Remember that whole thing about Barcelona five years that's ago? That's right, yeah. Barcelona's oh, you must go to Barcelona. That's where it's all happening. happening. <laughs> <laughs> and he is terribly good to work with. You always feel there is a, a, a ping pong, there's a, there's a give and take there. I mean, he, he doesn't just work for himself, he works with uh, people in scene. I find Robbie uh, very attractive, so... Uh, there's no chance that Susie Kettles wasn't going to find him an attractive partner, eventually. I mean, I had to keep them apart for a long time. Essentially, uh, I'm a movie actor where you, you do things in very short bursts. Uh, and he knows, I mean, he's got an innate sense of where the camera is and plays. Not into the camera, but to the camera, into the audience, beyond the camera. <laughs> Oh, 
that's Jesus. But it's awfully young. He don't even get a beard, just a bit of bum fluff on his tart lip. Looks awfully nice. The stories, of course, people will be familiar with. I mean, people have been brought up in a Christian tradition, although I certainly don't think that you would miss a great deal if, you, if you'd never opened the Bible. Ladies and gentlemen, <clears throat> the raising of Lazarus, and through an extraordinary bit of mean-mindedness by the management, I shall be obliged to play everybody. Well, it requires an actor who can, first of all, fill the stage and populate the stage with as many as um, 20, 30 characters. I mean, it's got to be someone who can switch from, for instance, with the blind man and the cripple, a duologue that lasts 15 to 20 minutes and someone wearing the raising of Lazarus is conveying an entire crowd. Yeah. I've worked with Robbie in the past and, and he seemed a very, very obvious choice. Um, because he has got that ability, he's got the acting talent plus the comedy. The last time I was there, oh dear, the last miracle, right? I turned up bright and early, sat myself down by the grave. I'd been hanging around half the day. And did they not go and perform the bloody thing at the other end entirely? Two miles away. I saw nothing. I was devastated. But this time, this time, <laughs> this time I've made the effort to find out the fellow's name in advance. Lazarus, you see? So all I have to do is find the gravestone with Lazarus written on it and sit down and I'll see everything. Oh, holy mother of God. Even if I do find the gravestone with Lazarus written on it, how will I know? I can't read nor write. Most people didn't read or write. This is something you've got to remember. Most people didn't speak any Latin. So they literally didn't understand a word of what was going on in church. They really didn't have a clue. They went in, there was all these stained glass windows. They knew roughly, there was, I mean, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, it was explained in a kind of family symbolic way. But <clears throat> what they used to do is they used to act out the mysteries and everybody had a part. You know, community theater, great fun. But of course, even that became corrupted because certain parties would always get to play Joseph and Jesus and certain parties would always get to play Barabbas. So there was this kind of corrupt class system going on within the performances, which is why the jonglers were doing the alternative version at the other side of the graveyard. They'd all be going, I'll tell you what really happened. Do you want to hear the real and of course everybody it was very naughty to listen. The thing about this piece is that although you know you could say it is very scurrilous and it it takes side swipes at the big religions and the authorities the th one thing it is is it's very respectful of the the religious mysteries and that tradition. <laughs> Again, Mason Boyne and his bold orange men with the shake of the hand and the kick in the joint. Mason Boyne, Mason Boyne, Mason Boyne. So, well, it's very important whether or not there's a God, and also politically, it's very important how God is interpreted in our behalf. I mean, who is this committee between ourselves and our Creator? Well, would you deny what's in the Bible? Would you, Morag? It's all here. Matthew chapter 2, verses 1 to 10. All you have to do is jumble the words up a bit. <laughs> Oi, he's coming. Who is? Jesus, what's his name? What's his name? Jesus, thing me. Oh, look at that. There's got all the apostles around him and the saints. I ken him. I ken him. That's Paul, him with the baldy napper and the big beard. And that'll be Peter sitting beside him. How many off long here? Jeez, do you think he ever cuts the own beard? Hey, oh yeah, hey, Mark. <laughs> Hi, Mark. Great to see you. Oh yes, yes. Mark and I are like that. He's never away from your house. Whoa, <laughs> Betty will be sorry she missed him. We were all brought up with these terribly po-faced Victorian woodcuts of what happened in the Bible, and everybody's standing like that in their dressing gowns, you know, with the long beards, looking miserable. But I mean, you know, if you think about it, can you imagine what it'd be like going to? Uh, a cemetery and seeing some guy walking up out of the grave. I mean, you know, they've made three-hour movies on less, you know, evidence. Uh, it must have been quite incredible, and that's what we've tried to do. We tried to make it a, I nearly said a total experience. I'm showing my age there. Um, <laughs> uh, the idea is just to make the audience feel that they were there as well, which is the essence of all storytelling. Hey! 
Jesus, could you tell that wine about the laws of the fishes? That's a cracker. I'm quite sure we'll see Robbie uh, directing pictures uh, within the fairly near future. It's a thing he'd be very good at, indeed, because he's got a, an understanding of what makes people tick, and he's got an understanding of what makes movies tick. Me, 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 me. <laughs> you did ask. <laughs> you can see the full version of Mr. Obuffo on BBC Two in April. <laughs>